Hi, welcome to part 12 of our Building and Researching Your Family Tree series. Today we'll be talking about writing a biographical sketch. My name is Hannah and I am the Genealogy Reference Librarian here at the Waco Genealogy Center. And today I will be joined by Bill Buckner, the Genealogy Center Supervisor. Let's get started. I wanted to start today by talking about an example of what writing a biographical sketch might look like. This is an example that was published in Heart of Texas Records, which is the Central Texas Genealogical Society's quarterly. And this story is called Vermont to Texas, Roland William Barton's Journey by Norma Palmer Canada. Here's a close up of an excerpt from this article. And this article tells the story of Roland Barton's journey from Vermont where he was born to Texas where he spent the rest of his life. And so as we look at just these first two paragraphs of the story, we can see that she pulled information from many of the different records that she had used in her research. So we have information about the family group that she found in the census, birth and death dates for his siblings, which might have been found in cemetery records or obituaries. She also included some information about historical context. So his family settled in Vermont shortly after Vermont had become a state. And that's an interesting part of their story. She also pulled information from land records. And then as she starts talking more specifically about Roland's life as an individual, we have information from the Civil War Union roster, from personal documents that have ended up in archives, as well as his Civil War service records. These are different types of documents that we talked about using in research earlier in the series. So to learn more about using any of these types of records, check out the videos earlier in the series. To put together this information into a biographical sketch, the first step is going to be to interview your ancestors. Wouldn't it just be such a dream to be able to sit down with your ancestors and ask them what exactly happened? Who was involved? Where did it take place? When did it happen? Why did you do it? How did you do it? Um, that's not exactly possible, but what you can do is you can ask those questions from the records. So as you do your research, keep these questions in mind and think about what record might answer these different questions? Because these are the types of questions that we really want to use when we're telling a story. As you look at the records, you want to evaluate what that information is telling you and then what can you add to it to fill in more of the story. So if on the 1880 census, you see that your ancestor was listed as a farmer, what did he farm? Well, the agricultural census that was completed in the same year on a separate document might have the information about what type of livestock he was raising, what types of crops he grew, and possibly what happened to that. Was he manufacturing anything on his farm in addition to growing things? And so looking at those supplemental census records can help answer those types of questions and add more layers to your story. Maybe you have a marriage record that shows that they were married by a Methodist minister. Well, now you have an idea of what denomination that this couple was. What church did they attend? Are church records still in existence from that church? And can you find additional information like the baptism of their children? Were they founding members of that church? There's all sorts of things that you can delve into when you read into that deeper layer of a record. If on the 1900 census you see they lived in a city, check other city directories and not only that year, but years prior and years later to build a timeline of how long they had been there, where they were living specifically within that city, and even what they may have been doing, a more specific occupation may be listed. And then look at fire insurance maps, which may be available for that city in the time period that they lived there to get an idea of what the home they lived in looked like and maybe the business that they owned, what did that look like? How large was it? Was it in the middle of town? Was it on the outskirts of town? That's the kind of thing that you can use to help build a fuller story. 
You also want to use genealogical forms to help organize your information. Not only do they help you get organized as you're doing the research, but including these types of charts in published material can also help your reader who may not be as familiar with all of the different relationships understand how people are related. It helps us collect basic information and helps highlight what we might be missing. Have we really found all of the names, dates, and places that we need to in order to have a full story? It's also a way that you can review your source material and make sure that you have a citation for every fact that you've found. A timeline is another important tool when we're telling a story. This puts the facts of your story into chronological order and allows you to see maybe what you're missing and help make sense of the relationship between the information. It also helps to review historical context, which may help you understand why certain decisions were made in your ancestor's life, maybe what motivated a move um, or what motivated an occupation. Here's an example of a timeline. Once all of this information was put into chronological order, some events that had seemed separate began to make more sense or become more interesting. For example, once this information was in a timeline, it became apparent that this couple's first son was born just two months after their marriage. It also became apparent that I was missing a 1900 census. So I had thought I had found all of the census records for this ancestor, but once it was in a timeline, I realized I had never actually found them on the 1900 census. It also allowed me to realize that on the 1910 census, it said that they had had 12 children born and only seven were still living. And I realized there were three children that I had never identified. And then while most of their records happened in McLennan County, Texas, the wife died in Kaufman County, Texas. And so why was it that she died so far away from where they were living? These are all questions that now that I have highlighted that information within a timeline, I can look for answers to, to help fill in those gaps in the story. And using a timeline, I think it is helpful to input the information into a spreadsheet. So using something like Excel or Google Sheets is a great way to do this. The columns I use are year and then the date that something happened, how old the individual was at the time that that event happened, events that happened in their life, family events, where things happened. And then I include a separate column for historic events. So this might be statehood or a war or the establishment of a new church or a new railroad that affected the family. And then I also include a column with a brief note about where the information came from. And then you can color code the different columns or different boxes as is needed to help you easily reference the information. And my source and notes column, I just list enough detail or a URL to help me find the record again. The full citations I keep in another document. But what's really important and not just timelines, but any way that you organize information is you need to use a system that works best for you. So you can adapt a system to fit your needs. The ultimate goal is really just to help you visualize your ancestor's life, identify gaps in information, and add historical context. Here's a close-up example of what you might include in a timeline. So here we have um, that this individual lost his mother at age one and a note that that information came from the cemetery. And then shortly after the Civil War ended, so this individual had been born right at the beginning of the Civil War. A few years later, he also lost his father. And by 1870, he was living with his grandparents on the 1870 census. And so this is just sort of an idea of how you can combine that historical information with um, information that you find in other records. So when is enough enough? When have you finished your research and feel, can feel confident that it's time to start writing the story? You'll never find everything, but you need to start somewhere. An exhaustive search 
can make sure that you have looked as many places as you can and answered as many questions as you might be able to at this point. We'll talk a little bit more about exhaustive searches in just a minute. And when do you stop writing? When have you written as much as you're gonna write about a person? Well, when you've achieved your goal. So once you have written the story that you have set out to write, it's ready to be published either in a journal or in your book, because you can always write additional material later if more information is found. When do you stop worrying over the index? Again, once you've reached your goal. So if you set goals in the beginning, then you'll know how to answer some of these questions for when can I say I'm done? So having a plan, some parameters in place from the beginning will help you know when you are reaching a point that you are confident in saying, I'm complete in this project. But what if you solve your brick wall after you publish the book? That's something to celebrate. We work really hard to solve these mysteries in our family. So even if you solve it after the book is published, that's exciting. In fact, if writing your book is the thing that gets you to solve your brick wall, that's even better. So if it's after it's been sent to the publisher and you find new information, celebrate and write another book. The genealogical proof standard is used to make sure that we have completed a reasonably exhaustive search. You wanna make sure that all of the information that you include in your work has a complete and accurate source citation. So make sure that every fact that you're including was found in a reliable source and is cited within your work so that future researchers know where you found that information. You wanna analyze the information you've collected because you will find conflicting information in your research. Maybe one source has a different year of birth than another source. And so you wanna resolve that conflicting information. Sometimes it may be difficult to do. So if you do have conflicting information that you aren't able to resolve, let your reader know that, that it's controversial when exactly someone was born and that there's two different possibilities for that birth date. You want a sound conclusion that is coherently written. So letting your reader know where you found your information, how you have resolved these conflicts, and what research still needs to be done to further understand these conflicts is really important. Now, Bill Buckner will be talking to you about your research goals and objectives. So our goals and objectives, uh, let me encourage you to make some decisions about your project. From format, style, goal, numbering system. Is your book gonna be a narrative uh, written in the first person, third person? Uh, is it gonna be a reference uh, of just factual material? Is it gonna be a biography or a memoir? Uh, what format does it take on? Uh, think about the style el elements in your writing. Uh, have you set yourself a goal and then numbering system? Is it, it's gonna be a formal genealogy. You wanna be able to uh, help people identify who these people are you're talking about and a numbering system does that for you. Think about the hands-on writing experience that you've had. Um, a lot of us don't write every day. Um, that's what this exercise is about, is to get you to think about how to write again. Uh, it's been a long time since school, and uh, if we haven't written, as they say, writers should write every day, and that's, in fact, a, a truth. Uh, you need to write every day as you start writing and researching. Uh, whether it's just a little bit, take the time to write. And learn about the resources available to you. Um, Every collection has its value as a print collection. We have a lot of material online, uh, but think about the people that are there to help you as well. So let's think again about the research cycle. We talk about this in our beginners class at the very, very beginnings. We say, identify what you already know. Uh, taking the things around you in your home, asking your cousins, uh, and then decide what you want to know. This is 
the first draft of your goal. What do I want to know about my family that I don't know already? And then you look for records uh, to help find out about that information, obtain and search out those records. And then you say, how can I use this information? And this is where we get stopped in our writing. Uh, we tend to be collectors of information instead of doing something with the information. Uh, I want to encourage you to write and do something with that information. Okay. Our goal, purpose, vision, objectives. What was that original goal that you first had when you walked in the door as a beginner and said, I, most people say, I really want to pass on my family knowledge to my children, to my grandchildren, to my family. I'm kind of the designated historian. And I want to make sure that our story is remembered, it's told correctly. Um, so my family, our, my first uh, goal would have been probably to research back the Buckner line to the Thomas and Hannah uh, that had like multiple children. That was a, a, a good goal to, to have at the beginning. And as you research that goal, has it changed? Uh, yes, uh, sometimes the information is overwhelming. Sometimes it's too scarce. Uh, our goals can change and we need to be aware that we don't have to, have to beat ourselves up because we're not going to uh, complete the goal that we first started with. We can change our minds. Uh, so in this case, I might be focusing on the three generations that walked across the state line together um, prior to after right after the Republic. Um, and so it is OK to change your mind. Uh, Influences of that could be uh, your interest, um, interest of your family. Maybe you have a grandson that got really interested in the Civil War, and you can expand on your uh, ancestor that fought for the Union or the Confederacy. Uh, maybe it's the amount of material that's available to you. Maybe you thought there was a world of knowledge out there about your family, realizing that they were farmers and not much happened. And uh, it's not very exciting, but farming can be exciting. Um, and its importance to you and others. So think about your goals as you go along and maybe redraft what you want to do, but always have a goal in mind because it helps you. Once you write something down, uh, it's, it's important that you uh, try to achieve those goals. Isn't it neat to find a list from, you know, two years ago and you've checked everything off? Writing things down seems to happen that way. If you write it down, if you focus on it, it tends to get done. So time to make decisions. So what type of book are you writing? Uh, is it going to be a genealogical reference uh, with standard numbering systems, documented resources, footnotes, endnotes, uh, a bibliography and index relationships? Um, or is it a family history narrative? Is it more of a story type of a book where you've told the story uh, in, a, in just a kind of a first person narrative or uh, is it going to be an immigration story moving to Texas, life on the farm? Um, you know, what do they do? The hog killing at the end in, during the winter. Is that one of your stories? Biographies or memoirs? Uh, sometimes you focus on a single person or a couple, uh, and that makes a very interesting story where you can really expand on the family unit at that time. Or do you have a collection of family documents that you want to preserve by? Uh, transcribing those documents and then adding information to the who the people are, who the photos are, annotations, that sort of thing. But that's important as well. So who are you going to include? Well, we start in beginning genealogy and say start with yourself and work back each generation. That would be like an ascending lineage, collecting everybody and everybody uh, on the way, and that can be kind of difficult. Sometimes it's easier to think in terms of, I'm going to start with that third great grandfather that walked across the line with his son and, uh, and after the Republic and worked back from there to the present. So that would be a descending lineage. Uh, so ask yourself, how far back are you going to go? Are you going to go back to uh, uh, Charlemagne? Are you going to go back to uh, your immigrant to the United States? And how many family branches? Uh, when you start looking at ascending, are you just going to go to second cousins, second cousins once removed, second cousins twice removed? How many, how many lines, how many family units, how many branches are you going to include? Ah, this looks like writing. 
Let's talk a minute about the elements of a, a well-written story or just a story. So you have a story, that's a large picture, and you have plot, a theme, a setting. So setting might be what? Uh, the ranch in Texas, uh, character. Uh, did you have a, an uncle that was quite the character? Who, who were, what was their uh, context to the historical description of them? And is there conflict? There is always conflict. Conflict makes and breaks a good story. So remember the story that uh, Hannah brought up about Vermont to Texas? Let's take a look at that story and see if we take any of these elements, what they might be. So Roland Barton moved from Vermont to Texas by way of Missouri. He endured multiple injuries during the Civil War, but still managed to live a full life as a rancher. So what is the plot? Plot is structure given to the story. Uh, it's defined by the events that make up the story, his move, his ranch life, uh, particularly as they relate to one another through cause and effect. Um, he had multiple injuries. I wondered right off, was he, uh, did he break his own horses? Did he break, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, plot is a chain of cause and effect relationships. Plot involves a reader and why. Why did he move? Why did he come to Texas? Why did he go through Missouri and not some other way? Uh, plot involves that conflict and that resolution. Here are some other plot themes, rags to riches, wealth lost in the war, six son with no inheritance, or the soil play, played out for farmers. They owed back taxes and they were foreclosed on, poor to prosperity, story of family business, education leads to new opportunities. Um, immigration is a good plot. Movement west or to someplace else. The Irish family starving moves to find work. Uh, the land runs from Oklahoma and Georgia. The trail of tears, a forced immigration. And life on the home front. The various wars, the Indian wars on the home front, the uh, conflict on the, on the frontier, uh, the communication issues uh, that you find in the life on the home front. And themes, are there recurring themes you notice in family history? Uh, very interestingly, people look at, they start looking at their family and go like, well, that's like the fourth generation that got divorced, or maybe that's the fourth generation that went into law enforcement, or they were doctors, or maybe they were criminals. Um, family is constantly on the move. Maybe that's another theme, they settled in one place, but not for long. Um, and then strong women that raise their children alone due to either uh, fatalities during a war or maybe the uh, depression and the father left, who knows. But following opportunities, Rollin followed opportunities in the West the way, his same way his parents sought opportunity by moving to Vermont shortly after statehood. Um, and as you research your ancestors, you'll, you'll start to see these themes and then you can uh, expand on those to describe them uh, from one generation to the next. And how to make it interesting. Um, so by visual aids, photos, we saw the picture of the house, maps, illustrations, news clippings, descriptive writing, keep it factual, but descriptive writing. Discuss what resources were used or unusual discoveries along the way. Your reader wants to know, how did you find that out? Where did you find that document? I would like to read that in its entirety. So document those, those interesting finds that you find along the way because it makes it interesting and also informs the reader. Disclose what you don't know and what you're still curious about. Remember that uh, not everything has a resolution. Uh, sometimes your, your end result, your conclusion is to say, I could not find at this time when I wrote this book the answer to this question, state that fact so maybe a future generation uh, ancestor can answer those questions. Maybe that's their uh, spark to get them to, to look farther into your, uh, further into your uh, family history. Footnotes can help clarify sources of information without interrupting narrative. So sometimes there's a decision whether you're gonna put footnotes at the end of the page or at the end of a chapter or at the end of a book. Um, that's a personal decision, that's a style thing to do, to think about. So tied in historical context, including modern photo of the house that Rollin built, that's what we said before. 
and look at examples. Um, don't just trust it to instinct that you can find a, a, a style, a, a, a format that you really like. Uh, we have over 1,500 family histories in our collection. We get most of these through donations, so they're typically tied to Central Texas, to people doing research in our collection, or people tied to the Waco area. Uh, out of 32,000 32, books in our collection, uh, 1,500 is a, a large percentage, it's a nice percentage. So take a look, come in just with the goal in mind is to look at fan, other people's family histories and see what they've done and see if there's something that sparks an interest for you. Uh, the call number for family histories, uh, it's rather, it's a standard of 929.2. Uh, you'll find that in other collections besides ours. And more than just books, we've talked about books, but think about all the other ways to share your family story with your loved ones, uh, from a photo album to maybe a journal, short journal article, or doing an oral history during the um, holidays, or perhaps organizing a family reunion and finding out facts and seeing photos you've never seen before. Uh, newspaper columns, blogs, just uh, scrapbook presentations, a calendar. There's all kinds of things you can do to share your, what you've learned about your family with those that you love. Now, challenge. I would ask you to pause this video just for a moment and write down the answer to these questions. Which of my ancestors has a story that I would like to write? Um, and why is it important for me to tell the story? And when is the deadline for completing this project? So we'll just take a moment and we'll come back in a few minutes and we'll talk about this. So which of your ancestors did you decide to write about? Was it your parents? your grandparents? Was it an ancestor that you've never met that you found interesting? Why is it important to tell this particular story? Did you know that we are the guardians? We are the protectors uh, of our family stories. Who else will have an interest in our family stories but those that are directly descended from them? Think about that. When is my deadline for completing this project? Well, your deadline, um, you know, the good Lord can call us any day and uh, it, it's time to get it done. And so that's the deadline is, is um, just to get it done, set yourself a goal and hopefully, hopefully you'll get to it as quickly as possible. Uh, don't push it off. I've had way too many experiences of people that push things off and they never got to writing their story. So don't be one of those people. Things to remember at the end here, we say interview your ancestors uh, to build a full story of their lives. Pretend that they are alive and sitting across from you and ask them the questions that you want information about. Determine who will be included in your story. Um, those things you can think about beforehand. It is never too soon, and I would say never too late to start writing your story. And you can adapt your goals from what you did 20 years, decided 20 years ago, that you can do something today to write and share your family story. With that, I'll say thank you for joining us for this series. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it, and we hope that you learned something from it. And we are just glad to do this series and help you in, in your endeavor. Remember that if you have questions, please call us at the uh, Genealogical Center here, the Genealogy Center at 254-750-5945, or you can email us at the uh, email there below. And thank you again. Bye-bye.